Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, attending the CSA Connect event 2023. This is the premier edition that brings together visionaries, entrepreneurs, and industry leaders to shape the future of entrepreneurship in Canada. The theme that we have focused on is Champions of Change, Unveiling Canada's Startup Landscape. I'm Preeti Ruparel, and I'm the MC of the event, and it's a pleasure to stand before you on behalf of Canada Startup Association, CSA. Thank you. Um, in my daily role as a small business consultant at the City of Richmond Hill Small Business Enterprise Center, I'm a bridge builder and I support domestic entrepreneurs so that they can thrive in their business and grow, whether they are exploring entrepreneurship, starting their business or existing businesses. Now beyond this, my commitment is not just stop there. I'm very happy that I could volunteer with Canada Startup Association and here I play the role on community development. It's truly inspiring to be part of an organization that is dedicated to forging pathways, amplifying growth opportunities, and fostering a thriving entrepreneurial ecosystem. Speaking of challenges, just over three weeks ago, I completed my first full marathon at Niagara Falls. And uh, it's my first marathon, so the runner's high. Yet I'm a marathoner, and I've added that on my LinkedIn profile. <laughs> but the runner's high that I feel, um, uh, the, the similar feeling I feel, uh, I, the similar feeling I have when I'm working with entrepreneurs, and I'm very glad that I could be part of the Minas Canada Startup Association. Um, without further ado, let's embark on this exciting journey of CSA Connect 2023. Engage with our esteemed speakers here. We have your uh, network with like-minded individuals and let's collectively shape the future of entrepreneurship in Canada. Thank you for being here and let the event unfold with inspiration, innovation, and collaboration. Please join me first in welcoming Taylor Curran, the Senior Coordinator of Membership Engagement from the Toronto Region Board of Trade. We are delighted to partner with this APEX trade body representing key stakeholders in the Canadian ecosystem. Today, we provide a platform for all of you to connect and explore avenues to develop mutually beneficial collaboration. So stage, uh, the stage is all yours, Taylor. Awesome, well thank you all for coming today. And at the Board of Trade, all of our, a lot of our members host workshops similar to this. And we actually set a record for registrations for workshops for members. So congratulations to Canada Startup Association. That's awesome. So thank you all for being here today. My name is Taylor and I work for the Board of Trade. Um, I'm the account manager for Canada Startup Association. So thank you all for being here today. I'm going to take 30 seconds of your time and no one wants to hear from me. So then we'll hand it back to the pros. Um, I just want to acknowledge the land that we are on, which is home to diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. The board's offices are located on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations. They share with us a sense of responsibility for intergenerational equity, the well-being of today and tomorrow. And I'll pass back to Priti for the rest of the day. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Taylor. Um, moving on, our next speaker is a source of personal inspiration for me. She epitomizes strength, grit, and determination. Far from being a damsel in distress, she's passionately dedicated to creating a positive impact in the community. I've had the privilege of knowing Themina Chaudhary since 2019 when I managed her application for the Startup Visa Program during my tenure at the Toronto Business Development Centre, TPDC. What struck me most was her ability to juggle responsibilities and navigate various roles in both her personal and professional life with Panache. Themina was always ready to participate in the application process, showing boundless energy even during our mentor review calls, which was past midnight for her in Pakistan. Today, it fills me with pride to witness a progress in the Canadian ecosystem, where she's carved a niche for herself as an entrepreneur and bridge builder. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming the CSA founder, founder Thamina Chaudhary. Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. First of all, thank you so much for being here and trusting us. And thank you, Preeti, for your kind words. Uh, today, I want to share a story with you. But don't worry, it's not a long story. And it's just not any story. Uh, but it's a tale of transformation, preservance, and a commu about community. It's my story. And I believe in many ways, it's our story too. Because I'm sure that it would resonate 
each one of you in one way or another, being an entrepreneur, being an immigrant, or a newcomer, or a startup founder. So just picture a young girl from Karachi, Pakistan, a third world country, and I was living in Karachi. Karachi is like the most populated city of the world, and we call it like a concrete jungle. But for me, you know, I love nature, and I found my solace in butterflies. Yeah, we still had butterflies there in that concrete jungle. So, and I love the metaphors, uh, metaphors of the butterfly, you know, that it's gone through its life cycle. The transformation process inspired me. And little did I know that it would become a metaphor of my own work, my life, because, you know, it is a journey just like a startup, you know, idea, launch, growth, and maturity. As a woman entrepreneur in a Petrachi society, in a challenging environment, my love of nature and passion of saving nature inspired me to co-found Insta Foods. Insta Foods, almost 20 years back. Insta Food is uh, on a mission of reducing food waste, and uh, we are trying to reduce it at every stage, stage from the far to the kitchens. I got the letter of support for a startup visa in 2019, just like Preeti said, from Toronto Business Development Center. But uh, I came to Canada in 2020, just exactly three years before, in November, 20th November, I landed here. And why it took me one year after getting the letter of support, it's another story about startup visa intricacies and, you know, uh, many loopholes. And we will sh I will definitely share it some other time. So I brought Insta Foods with me with the same passion, same vision in a different environment. When I step into Canada, in my mind, I have plans for Insta Foods. I think everything, you know, I have everything sorted out. Like, okay, you know, I'm just taking on the world. And, uh, but the path was not easy, and it was an entirely new landscape. I had no network, no social capital, and it was intimidating, honestly. Starting from scratch in a land where my voice was new, uh, my connections was few, and no family, no friends. I just knew pretty, and I also knew, got to know Nyla, who, you know, who was just introduced to me through a common friend. And I have a friend who, was, who is a homemaker, and I landed at her house, and I, because I don't, didn't know anyone. And you know, just like any immigrant, the initial days were filled with trials. It took me time to understand the market dynamics. It took me longer to get to know the key players in the ecosystem. As I always say now, to make anything happen in Canada, you need to know someone who knows someone. I, and you know, this is uh, this is the reality. I think most of you have gone through. So, uh, for me, for me, it was a new country, building a network, understanding the Canadian market, grappling with the nonsense of a different business culture. Uh, each day was a learning curve. Each setback was a lesson in resilience. But through this struggle, I realized something profound and very important. I was not alone. Even I was going through the journey alone, but I was not alone. Many immigrant entrepreneurs, newcomers, shared the same journey, each with their own unique story of courage and aspiration. This collective narrative of struggle and triumph led to the birth of Canada Startup Association. We envision is as a beacon for entrepreneurs navigating through the Canadian business landscape, which is a little bit complicated. Um, CS is more than an organization. It's a community, it's a support system, and a shared dream for all of us. I'm sorry I have it written because I don't want to forget anything. <laughs> I landed in Canada, as I say, like exactly three years, and now I'm here running multiple businesses, helping many other entrepreneurs like me who are struggling here uh, to, you know, to uh, establish in Canada because I don't want them to go through the same journey, same struggles that I have to gone through. So this is my opportunity to provide a platform to any startup coming to Canada so that, as I said, we don't need to face the same challenges that I face. That's why Canada Startup Formation Association formation are not for profit member organization. At CSA, we recognize the value of time, the importance of connection. Our mission is to facilitate 
a smoother journey for startups, whether they are newcomers, immigrants, or someone who has just had an aspiration to start something. So we are providing a platform for learning, networking, and growth. And we aim to transform the entrepreneur landscape, making it more accessible and nurturing for those who are coming after us. CSA is based on two fundamental principles. We will provide members peer-to-peer -peer learning opportunities, and we will help them build their network so that they can integrate in the ecosystem quickly and smoothly. For any business, time is everything. The most precious investment that any founder can do, especially with the startups. So instead of struggling to find the right connections, right people, and finding someone who can introduce them, a founder should be able to connect via existing networks to a wider you know, ecosystem players across Canada. And we aim to create this butterfly effect in Canadian eco startup system. Today we have around, I think, 60 plus butterflies here in this room. And tomorrow this impact can reach you all over Canada. So as we gather here today, we are not just celebrating the launch of an association or an, another organization. We are celebrating the spirit of entrepreneurship, the power of community, the resilience of every individual who dares to dream. No matter what they are doing, from where they are coming, what resources they have, like the butterfly. Let us spread our wings and soar to new heights in the Canadian startup sky today. Together, let's create an ecosystem where every startup, especially those led by immigrants and newcomers, can not just survive, but thrive and flourish here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tevina. You know, as you shared your immigration story, you know, uh, I moved here to, in Canada seven years ago, not as an entrepreneur, but, you know, there was a certain school of hard knocks that you learn and, you know, how you build your network. You meet one person, then you ask, can you connect me to you and someone from your network? And that's how I built my network. So it's very important to have a good network out here in Canada, whether to profile yourself or to bring in your business. And you, in regards with the butterfly, I do have butterflies in my stomach. I'm here hosting for the first time so um, I'm going to decipher the butterfly effect in a good way now like ready to spread my wings so thank you for this opportunity um, I just have one thing to say I always share this when I do an information session you know uh, uh, speaking to aspiring entrepreneurs when all of you who want to um, you know um, want to do good uh, be successful as a business uh, as a business owner uh, promise yourself that tomorrow you will pay forward to the community so I'm very happy as Demina shared her immigration story Story, how she is now paying forward to the community by starting the Canada Startup Association. Um, now let's get ready for an engaging panel discussion as we delve into the theme, re-engineering the business model in an evolving landscape. We have distinguished panel of experts here, and this discussion promises to be a treasure trove of insights into the dynamic landscape of Canadian business, shedding light on the latest trends, challenges, and opportunities. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator for this session, Hamad Siddiqui, the Executive Director of Canada Startup Association. Before I extend a warm welcome to Hamad, allow me to share a bit about him. Hamad is not just a moderator, he is a digital solopreneur with a passion for both startups and e-learning. With a career spanning over 36 years, wow, he has been instrumental in guiding numerous clients towards achieving excellence in growth and personal branding. Hamad has worked in 12 countries with organizations such as British Deputy High Commission and Center for International Private Enterprise, an affiliate of US Chamber of Commerce. With a wealth of experience and expertise, Hamad is here to guide us through the conversation and provide a head start into the intricacies in the evolving Canadian business scene. So let's welcome Hamad Siddiqui to lead us through this insightful panel discussion. Hamad, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, very, very inspiring stories. Uh, I came to Canada in 1992 as a visitor first, and I fell in love with the country because I landed in Calgary. And it was June, so you can imagine, right? Uh, I think this happens with everyone. That's why a lot of people are coming. They are interested in coming to Canada. 
But when they come here, there are challenges. And when you move from one country to another country, there are challenges, of course. And this is what we are trying to do. But today is a very special day. Not only that we are launching formally Canada Startup Association, but also we are part of 10 million entrepreneurs across the globe who are celebrating Global Entrepreneurship Week during this week. So you are part of those 10 million entrepreneurs today. So if you plan to tweet, put something on Facebook or LinkedIn, use hashtag GEW, your post is going to go far. Uh, hopefully someone from GEW is going to pick it up and retweet it as well. So thank you very much. Uh, today's panel discussion is all about learning because I want to learn a lot. And, and the distinguished panelists that we have bring in wealth of knowledge. I would like to welcome uh, Robert Douglas from uh, uh, Roseview Global to come and join me at the panel. Right there, Robert. Thank you. And we have uh, uh, Kate Toman joining in from uh, Angel Investors Ontario. Please, thank you. Vicky Sanders from uh, Corliss and Kawal Ahmad, uh, an immigrant entrepreneur. How could you have a panel without an immigrant entrepreneur with us? So she comes and joins us uh, as a panel as well. So what we did, we, we tried to figure out some questions in advance. But what we agreed that we are not going to ask these questions. We want to be as informal as possible because you learn more when you're informal. And this is our opportunity to learn from these, these panelists, you know, squeeze whatever you can in the next half an hour um, and, and, and learn from, from, from the knowledge and implement those, that knowledge onto your own ventures. I would start with, uh, with Rob. Uh, Rob, uh, things are changing rapidly across the globe. Uh, there are talks about recession or no recessions or whatever. Where do you see uh, this whole ecosystem moving towards in the next three to five years? Uh, what, are, what do you think could be some of the challenges for startups starting now? Well, there are so many things that can be challenges, so I'll, I'll just touch on, on a couple. Um, first of all, we've got all kinds of technology that is gonna change the landscape. It could be AI, it could be blockchain, it could be clean tech, here knows what it could be, but technology is something that entrepreneurs are going to have to be comfortable with, grow with, all towards what I'll call an enhanced customer experience. That is what we are all trying to do. Uh, I also think that uh, we need to be aware that uh, as we employ people, and our employees are the most important people that we have, that we need to understand that uh, there are different ways of employing people today. Through the COVID period, we have learned that uh, some people like to work from home. They like a little more flexibility than they used to have. Maybe we can sum it up by saying life-work balance is different. So we have to recognize that there needs to be some flexibility in how we employ people in this environment and in this country. And then finally, I might say, I think that uh, uh, in terms of, of employees, we need to look to immigration and understand that immigration is something that's very important for us moving forward. Uh, uh, if we look at statistics, we know that uh, seven years ago, there were probably, uh, or rather 50 years ago, there were seven employees uh, of supporting every uh, retired person. Now we're down to about three and on our way to two. We need many more people coming to Canada to support our social system and keep us uh, in the happy circumstance that we are today. So we're gonna be inviting people from Pakistan and from uh, Iran and from Peru and from Venezuela. And these will be challenges in terms of integrating all the people together uh, into a harmonious unit. And I think I've probably said enough to get started. Well, thank you very much. And uh, you're so right, you know, with, uh, with more and more immigrants coming in, the plans are to bring in another 1.4 million immigrants, which means that we need a lot more skill development training and, and, and you know, the ability or some kind of, a, you know, infrastructure which will help them integrate in the society quickly. That's the first integration. And then they will only be able to use their skills uh, in, at the workplace. So thank you very much. Uh, Kate, uh, 
54% drop in angel investment funding in the US. This is what I picked up in the news. Is it happening in Canada as well? And uh, uh, I mean, just, just give us some insights to what is happening. Uh, so yeah, I don't have exact numbers in Canada, but I'd say similar. Um, I mean, Rob brought it up first, right? The big R word, I think we're all feeling the crunch of rising interest rates and not just interest rates, you know, everything has gone up in price from groceries, living expenses, right? Like I'm not telling you guys something you don't know. So when you see that, you know, that those things happening and a contraction in the public markets, you see that in investment dollars, certainly at the angel level where it is personal net worth, right? If I'm high net worth, I'm investing into startups. I see, you know, my net worth tank, <laughs> you know, in the stock market, um, I'm less likely to put money out there into entrepreneurs. So, uh, I mean, less capital in the ecosystem is worrisome. It certainly is an investor's market right now, which was, you know, we did quite the quick flip from a founder's market back in, what, 2021, when it just feels like we were giving up money to everyone. Um, so certainly startups, you know, revise your strategies when talking to investors, but uh, yeah, it's been an interesting year. <laughs> right. So we'll see what happens next year, I don't know. Yeah, um, I'll come back to you for, and the next question would be about, you know, what do we do if we are a startup? How do we approach, um, you know, whether it's a seed funding organization or an angel investor? VC is just probably a little bit far from, uh, from a smaller investor or a smaller startups, but that would be the next question. Uh, Vicky, your uh, initiative is a uh, predominantly women-led initiative. Uh, I worked in my previous job helping Women Chamber of Commerce go in very difficult environment, such as Nepal, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, as far as Papua New Guinea, actually. And what I've seen is that women are very resilient. You know, I found them uh, more interested in doing the right thing the right way, and they're willing to learn. What is your insights into um, the ecosystem here? Because what we see is that a lot of immigrant women coming in, but they don't become part of the entrepreneurial ecosystem. What is, what is something which we should do as organizations, as, as people who work in the ecosystem, to encourage them, use their skills, and use their talent, and become more you know, entrepreneurially, as, as if I put it this way? Uh, thanks. Yeah, so, uh, well, I, I'm very excited about a lot more immigrants coming into Canada. I, mean, I, I just think this is such a, an answer for our economic growth um, and creating a strong economy, but also just for market knowledge of what it's like around the world as, as we're uh, you know, exporting. So, I mean, I see lots, I don't see this as a, as a real challenge. I see there's just a lot of opportunity in this area. So um, we've seen a lot of new organizations emerging and really excited, Tamina, that you're launching this uh, organization because it's really about plugging in, as you said, right? What are some of the big challenges when you get here is how do I find customers? How do I access networks? How do I get influencers to open doors before I'm ready? Like all of that stuff is just absolutely critical. And I, I mean, I really think that the businesses of the future in the ecosystem of support for entrepreneurs is around community as a service. How can you plug into existing communities uh, and then find your customers more easily? And that's really what, uh, one of the things we're doing at Coralis, where we have, um, we have a different way of funding ventures. We're looking for revenue generating ventures. Imagine that, not just people who need to raise money. And like, uh, this is, I think that's the future of the next question for you really, which is uh, anyone who's at break even or profitability. Imagine that, imagine actually getting a customer instead of going out and finding an investor. Um, and so this is one of the things that we help a lot of organizations in our community do. Uh, we have a community of women across the country who are contributing capital, and then we loan that capital out at 0% interest to entrepreneurs who have business ideas that are somewhere between 50K and $2 million in revenue. And then we become their customers and advisors and supporters to help them grow their businesses and export, and we're doing this in five countries. Um, so we're really looking for those business ideas where people are generating revenue. And so we'd love to have more uh, immigrants coming into our community as well, which is a big focus for us. Awesome. Uh, so basically, if, uh, if organizations such as you know, CSA and others collaborate and we actually build their capacity, you know, some of these, these uh, uh, 
not so much of entrepreneurs, but they're very skilled from back home. Uh, and, and you kind of help them understand that the ecosystem is there. You just have to use your skills and knowledge and build something out of it rather than looking for a job opportunity. And to speak about this, we have Kamal sitting just next to me, uh, an amazing entrepreneur, and she made it. So she came from Pakistan. She's a community builder. Um, uh, I've known her. My wife loves her. So a lot of Pakistani women love her for her work that she has been doing. So uh, the question to you, Kamal, is that coming to a new country, what were some of the initial challenges uh, that you faced, and how did you overcome those challenges? You know, um Whenever we think about immigrants, especially those who have not immigrated, I think the easiest example that I like to give is, how does it feel like to move a house? You know, you're leaving behind your safe spaces, you're leaving behind you know, the bedroom you probably spent the last 10 years in, um, you know how the bedroom door creaks when you open it, you know how the faucets sound when you turn them on, and having to leave all of that behind and maybe move you know, one neighborhood away or a city away. And you know, it feels like you've left a part of yourself behind. So when you talk to an immigrant, or when you try to understand their journey, they've not just left a home behind, they've left their everything. They've left their streets, their community, their people, their customers, that inflow of money that they were getting, that, that, was, that was, all of that was their safe space. And when they come here, they have none of that. They don't have the customers, they don't know about their vendors. If they're a product-based business, they don't even know where their vendors are. If they've brought some cash along to start off the business, a lot of that cash is devalued, especially from countries like ours, where you know the rupee is so much less in comparison to the dollar. So when you arrive here, you're like not just battling the cold and you know all of these things, but you're also battling the fact that uh, you had all of these aspirations and you were the best known baker or the best known media personality or you know the biggest tech startup founder in Pakistan, and all of a sudden you're a nobody here. When you walk into a room, people are just like, oh, who's that? I'm sorry, but who invited you? Like, what do you even do? And that, in that moment, like, that crushes you. You know, you, you think of yourself, or you've built yourself up for the last 10 years doing something, and suddenly you're a nobody. And you have to start from the ground up. And when I came here, I had already built my media empire in Pakistan, and I'd fought with a lot of things. I'd fought with the patriarchy, I'd fought with financial issues, I'd fought with my own family to be somewhere. And when I came here, I didn't know where to turn to. I didn't know who to speak to. There were no communities here. Um, there, were no, there was nobody I could really talk to. And over the last five years, um, I've been able to finally find my people. I've been able to finally talk to people about what it is that I want to do. I've finally been able to find partners for my work. And it's been very challenging. And um, I think uh, this is the biggest thing, finding your people. And once you find those people, just like Tahmina said, you just need to know somebody to be somewhere. But that finding that first somebody is, I think, the hardest part. And um, I think that's what I would probably say is the biggest challenge so far. That is absolutely right. I think a lot of people in this room would resonate to this thing. Um, uh, although I've been coming and going to this beautiful country for many, many years, I face the same thing. You know, your network is your net worth. And you leave your social capital behind when you're moving to a new country. I used to raise uh, chickens, you know, when I was, uh, I was little. And you, if you put a chicken that you were putting in, well, the chicken that lives in one cage, you just move that chicken to the other cage, you will find the, you know, a, a disturbed chicken. Chicken is full of anxiety and she doesn't like it. Moving a complete home and finding, um, somebody told me actually a nice story. Uh, so Pakistanis were never a coffee drinking nation. It's too hot to drink coffee. Now we do. Uh, so he came here, and uh, the first time he ordered coffee at Tim Hortons, and he did not know what type of coffee he, he should take. So he just took a coffee, which was like bitter, <laughs> technically speaking. And this, these are the experiences that you gain, and once you find, you rightly said, the right, right connections, and you build those connections and build your network, things become much more easier as, as we, we go, go along. Um, I'll just go back to Rob, uh, and Rob, I would like to pick your brain up on um, what we see is downsizing of some businesses, uh, at least beginning of downsizing of businesses, businesses in Canada particularly. Uh, a lot of organizations are laying off. You know, we just heard 3% uh, 
uh, employees from uh, Kenyan tires have been laid off. Um, so the impact of uh, this laying off, which, is, which means more people out there looking for job opportunities, and organizations sh shrinking, will technically impact the gross domestic product for the country as well. Um, what do we do and, uh, as startups? You know, because this is where the customers are, right? The bug bigger organizations are usually the customers for smaller organizations. How do they approach these startups? You know, what, what is one thing or two things you think they should be doing in countering, uh, first of all, the fear? There is a fear out there that you know, things are difficult. Uh, and uh, and how, do, how do they actually navigate through these, these difficult times in the economic space? Well, if I could speak to uh, international entrepreneurs in, in particular, uh, what I am always astounded by is that what I hear when people approach our organization, which is a business incubator, and we're a designated entity under the startup visa program, I deal with experienced entrepreneurs from around the world, and yet the first thing they say to me is, I have no idea how to do business in Canada. And it's a surprise to me. And there are two gentlemen right here in front of me who are clients of our business, who are experienced business people, who have come to us and have been part of our program. We're very proud of uh, what they are doing and, and establishing in Canada. So our business is all about how do you do business in Canada? So we got a four pillar program that says, uh, first of all, what's our banking system, our legal system, our accounting system, uh, and so on. And, and we have subject matter experts like uh, TD Bank and Miller Thompson and uh, uh, KPMG who deliver materials that say, this is what our system is like in Canada and this is what you need to adapt to in order to be successful. Uh, we also lead people through taking their business plan and making it what I describe as being executable in the Canadian business context. So we start with a business plan that is solid, but maybe it's not going to work in Canada unless you are adaptable to what's going on here. So we go through a process of what we call workshops and then into incubation, which is about a three-month period where we look at everything from uh, product development to finance to marketing um, and, and uh, help people develop a, a business plan which is executable. And then finally, we move into a stage in our business which we call acceleration, which is us not delivering uh, a curriculum to people, but having our entrepreneurs come to us with questions. And it could be a simple question like, how do I navigate the banking system? How do I open an account in Toronto or whatever? Or it could be I need legal advice or I need some other kind of advice. So we are there and we carry people right from the point when they uh, started with us through to the point that they get uh, their PR, their, their uh, permanent residence in Canada. So we don't just drop people at any point. We carry them from end to end. But I, I think it's all about how do you do business in Canada? And that's what we try and convey. Right. Uh, so what I get from, from, from this is, you know, we really need to understand the culture. And really need to try to integrate into that culture rather than creating your own uh, little, little culture out of it. And also, uh, uh, the business ecosystem is very different from wherever we are coming in. Uh, so these two things, uh, if you put it right and you work with the right organization, uh, then the chances of your growth are very high. Kid, question. I'm a startup, I need money. Things are bad, how do I get it? <laughs> well, there will always be money for good startups. I think, you know, this was a bit of a market correction, um, right? Like I said, like 2021, like, right, you can look at the numbers, Canada and the US around the world, right? Like. VC numbers were like gangbusters, like everybody was getting money. So I think it was just a bit of a correction, but there's always money for good entrepreneurs that are building solid businesses. Um, like our groups are still investing, albeit at like a slower clip than usual. But like if you're building a solid business that you're putting together a good team, um, you understand your market, your product, I'll say our groups are still doing some pre-revenue deals. 
um, right? Like there's really interesting companies that are still doing cool things, like cool things in biotech, we've been seeing a lot, um, clean tech, of course, AI has sort of changed the game uh, for startups, so seeing a lot more of AI just across pretty much every industry. I will say, like, it's harder to raise money as a founder, but I wouldn't say that's necessarily a bad thing in a way. I think, right, like, there's money, there's still money for good founders. There's still a lot of dry powder if you're raising, you know, larger VC institutional rounds. Um, I think when we'll see challenges is probably when those funds go to raise their next rounds. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in the next year, two, three years, what's going to happen down the line? How will, you know, our economy change in that time? How will the world change in that time? But I think there's still money for good founders if you understand your business, your metrics. Um, I think you need to be a little more, you know, you, you have to be a little farther along maybe than you were in 2021 to raise money. Um, but it's still out there, and there are still lots of funds, angels, whoever out there that want to invest. Mm -hmm. um, I think that you, right, like you just right. Like so it's a little don't harder. lose hope. Yeah, don't. There is don't money available. <laughs> you have to be more pragmatic, I think, and you have to be yeah. more network more. Tell people your story, and that's how you build it up. Yeah, network so, more, but there's yeah. always money for good founders. I mean, my one advice to founders, you know, run your fundraising process like it's a sales process, right? There's, I think there's a lot of value in looking at it that way, but there's still founders. It might take you a little longer um, than it has in the past couple years, but um, certainly for innovative companies, there's still money around. All right, thank you. Vicky, uh, working with women entrepreneurs and building their businesses and finding, you said you become customers and you then, then of course, you know, work with different countries or help them export to different countries. What are some of the key areas uh, um, for, for growth you see uh, now and in the next couple of years? Um, industries, skill set, products? Um, yeah, so our, we have a portfolio of, um, we funded about 200 uh, women-led businesses, uh, and that's what our portfolio looks like at the moment. So we, we're starting to see a bunch of trends and, and challenges in, in specific sectors. Like, um, you know, the, I think a lot of, we're working with mostly smaller businesses, so in the, like, sort of uh, 100K in revenue up to 3, 4 million. So that sort of, like, small business group. And it's, it's a really, really challenging time right now in all sectors. We've seen, you know, the playing around with algorithms and e-commerce, just so many people's sales have sort of dropped off a cliff recently. And it's, it's not really explainable. It's really quite shocking how fast that stuff has happened. There's just a lot of changes in um, consumer behavior patterns uh, in terms of buying. And so that is, it's a bit confusing because people were literally, I mean, we have, a couple of ventures that were at three and a half, four million bucks in revenue and are gonna be like sub two million this year. Like just crazy in a six to eight month realm, uh, really shift in market conditions. So we're watching that really closely, trying to, to figure out how to support anyone who is kind of like partway through a fundraising round. Um, we, we've really seen, fun, I mean, funding for women entrepreneurs is a nightmare anyways, like 2% globally, but uh, it's, really, it's really, really dried up um, because women considered are considered by the brilliant marketplace that we have to be more risky, God knows why. Um, and so uh, that's been a lot more challenging. So if you're partway through raising funds uh, as a woman entrepreneur, like in the last little bit, it's, it's gotten much, much harder. And so a lot of our ventures are working really, really um, diligently to get to um, break even so that they can continue to go knowing that they're gonna need a longer runway. Um, so those are a few things, but from a sector perspective, I mean, we are, we're sector agnostic, so we support it, and we are, we're funding ventures that work on uh, what we call the world's to-do list, the sustainable development goals, and we have ventures across all of those. Um, but yeah, e-commerce has been really, really, really tough, and then, yeah, some uh, AI is obviously, like, really booming. Very keen on food security. There's a lot of really great stuff going on in ag, um, and export around that is really great. So... Um, Trends are really just, I, like, I'm just, everyone get to break even if you can. <laughs> um, and uh, if you're partway through raising, 
uh, doing any kind of pivoting to work on that and then figure out what's going on with direct to customers. Anyone who has access to their customers through mailing lists and stuff do really well. Uh, those that are trying to find them through ad sales um, really having a hard time right now with the algorithms. Oh, thank you very much. And this is what I see also because a lot of my students are e in the e-commerce business and they are really uh, finding it very difficult to, um, to keep it up, basically, you know, the sales are going down. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Kamal, you are in the, in the media, right? You know, uh, what role you think media um, and mostly ethnic media and the collaboration between ethnic media and the local media can play in improving the, uh, the ecosystem, first of all, for the immigrants who come in and they want to do business there? And what are some of the things that you think not happening at this point in time? So, um, so I have like background in two things, community and media. And just, just some perspective, uh, I come from the ethnicity in Pakistan, which is called Maimans. And Maimans are businessmen, like, or women. They are just born into do business. Yeah. I mean, even our babies can, you know, get you to buy something off them. So um, when Pakistan was being made, Maimans gave a blank check to Qaid Azam, who is our founding, uh, you know, we call him our founding father. They gave him a blank check and they said, you know, as much money as you need to build this land, we'll give it to you. That is the ethnicity I come from. And an insider tip from my community is that we believe in collaboration and not competition. So Maimans will have, let's say for example, there are 10 brothers and all of them sell the same cloth. They'll all sit on the same streets with shops next to each other and they'll sell the same cloth to the same customers and never beat each other over it because they believe in the power of collaboration. They'll even send customers to each other. So if one has ran out of the cloth, they will be like, hey, you could go to my brother, three shops down, he's gonna give you the cloth. Or you could go to my cousin in the store, you know, in the next street and he'll give you the cloth. That's what one way they are able to use community. The second way they do it is that they bar collectively bargain with their vendors. So they show up, numbers are power. So they can bargain more with their vendors they can, um, if there is a flood, they'll all support each other. If there is a, a crisis, a financial crisis in one person's house, the other community members will help. And this is despite the fact that in, you know, in traditional terms here in the West, they'd be considered competition. You wouldn't see Gucci and Prada next to each other being like, hey, you go buy a bag from them. No, like they'd be like, buy a bag from me. That's, that's how it works here. But over there, it's entirely different. And despite that, Despite that, they make massive profits. They do really well. They thrive as communities. And that is one thing that I really feel Canada needs. Canada needs to bring in the power of community in entrepreneurship. Because I really feel isolated as an entrepreneur here, which I didn't back in Pakistan. I had people to turn to. There were people who'd be willing to have my back, you know? Um, and I'm, I'm hopeful that, you know, organizations like these founded by Hamad and Tehmina and all of these inspirational people create that kind of platform that Canada needs for its entrepreneurs. So one thing, and now coming to your question as well about media, I think um, media plays the biggest role in amplifying voices. And um, I feel like not just um, traditional media, which is CBC or the broadcasters, but also there need to be more um, entrepreneurs coming into and creating new media platforms. I feel like it's very outdated to just have our CBCs for our digital platforms like that. And you know, people like me going up to CBC and being like, hey, could you give me like 100K so I can make a documentary? We don't need that anymore. This is the age of digital platforms, of YouTube, of people creating their own you know, um, streaming platforms. Why do we need to have just one place where we go to? And not only does it benefit the media industry as a whole in Canada, which is, by the way, very much behind where Hollywood is right now, we, Canada, Canadian media needs to grow, but also it'll help the entrepreneurs here as well. Because every entrepreneur needs a place to advertise, to be heard, to be seen. And this, these two industries kind of like should work together because each can amplify the other. One is a great source of revenue and the other is a great source of advertising and amplifying. So collaboratively, they can really make each other even more, more powerful and kind of grow both the industries. Well, you're absolutely right. Social media has, has just done wonders. 
so when I started my own uh, journey uh, as, a, as a digital solopreneur four years ago, I had 6,000 followers on LinkedIn. And LinkedIn is my baby, so I only work on LinkedIn. Now I've got about 68,000 followers across the globe. I run a podcast every Friday on career development. I usually get about six to 700 people signing up. This is the power of social media. And I mean, for her, I mean, she, when she goes live, you will see a million people watching her. Of course, she developed it over a period of time. Uh, thank you very much, panelists, for, for, for amazing uh, input. We have got the minister with us. We don't want to chew into her time. Uh, um, last, very quick, 30 second. Uh, one most common mistake people make when they are starting their entrepreneurial journey. And one advice that you want to give to uh, those new startups. So starting from okay. Bob. Um, uh, what should they do? And I would say network and uh, develop partnerships. And you've heard that before. Yeah. What is the most common problem? Not enough money. Businesses right. take longer to get started and are harder than you think. So don't go into a business undercapitalized. That is the, the largest reason for small businesses failing. Okay, so the number one mistake, I don't know, like that's hard. There's a lot of, I mean, I guess like missteps you can take, but I'd say like my piece of advice to founders and you know, when we hire young people is always, and this was the same advice given to me when I started my career is like, own your mistakes. Like nobody cares about your mistakes. It's how you, you know, how you correct them, how you fix them. It's like don't be afraid to try things, and if they don't work out, um, right? You just you move on. Or if you made a mistake, you know, acknowledge it and and figure out how to fix it and quickly move on. I think we don't dwell on it, and that's just and that's always carried me through my career. Uh, so I always tell founders, I tell our employees, it's like, just, you know, try, throw something at the wall, see if it sticks. Sometimes yeah. you just need to have that attitude. Yeah. Uh, yeah, for me, I would say that the thing that I see is the biggest challenge is just really how we're conditioned uh, to think that we need to do it all alone. And so a lot of people sit down and try and figure out how to do all of the things that they need to. And I mean, that's just the past way of doing entrepreneurship. I think the future is all about getting in a community understanding what you're really amazing at, surrounding yourself with people that have all the skill sets that you don't, and collaborating to do that. And I loved, loved, loved your story. So I need to read more about your history and your families. Oh, thank you so much. Um, I just want to say, and I, I want to say this to some of the entrepreneurs I know here in the audience, that don't doubt yourself. Your product is awesome. And you should know that it's awesome. And until and unless it's out there, you won't know that it sucks. Because once you find out that it sucks, you can make it actually awesome, right? So think of it that way, like, as long as you keep doubting yourself, you're never gonna be out there. If you're not gonna be out there, you'll never learn what it is that you need to fix to make yourself grow. Kamal, you nailed it so nicely. Self-limiting beliefs, get out of those. Uh, in the first month of my entrepreneurial career, I made $50, Canadian $50, not the US $50. You know, I could have stopped, but I did not. I kept trying and kept building it up. Thank you very much, panelists. You all stay here. We have uh, the Minister of Small Businesses uh, to speak. Uh, who's going to introduce? Yeah, over to you. Thank you, Hamad. Thank you. Thank you, Robert, Thank you. Kate, Kate Vicky, Kanwal. Great, great, valuable insight okay. that you shared. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it is a distinct honor to introduce our esteemed keynote speaker, Minister Nina Tankri, the Associate Minister of Small Business for the Government of Ontario. Before we hear from Minister Tangri, let me provide you with a glimpse into her remarkable journey. The Honorable Nina Tangri was elected to the Legislative Assembly of Ontario in 2018, representing the riding of Mississauga Streetsville. Her dedication to public service has been evident through various roles she has undertaken. In March 2023, she served as the Associate Minister of Housing, and in 2021, she assumed the role of the Minister of Small Business in Red Tape Reduction. In June 2019, Nina was appointed Parliamentary Assistant to the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Beyond her legislative duties, Minister Tangri has chaired the Standing Committee on Social Policy and contributed as a member of the Standing Committee on Justice Policy, the Standing Committee on Government Agencies and on Public Accounts. With over 35 years of professional experience in insurance and finance, Minister Tangri is not just a legislator, but also a seasoned entrepreneur and small business owner. 
Until her election to Ontario's 42nd Parliament, she served as the CEO of Tangri Insurance and Financial Group and president of Tangri BMT Insurance Brokers. Additionally, she has contributed to the community as the vice chair for Credit Valley Hospital. Minister Tangri's passion lies in bringing communities together. She collaborates with individuals, businesses and organizations to understand how the government can make Ontario the best place to live, work, invest and raise a family. She firmly believes that when communities prosper, Ontario prospers. And please follow her LinkedIn page. She, she is engaging with the community and I love following her and love reading how she is making a difference. So without much further ado, Minister Tangri. You, you want to go at the podium? Okay, all right. Uh, there will be a Q&A after you take. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Lovely to join you. It's great to see such a uh, packed room today here. But, uh, well, thank you very much, Preeti, for the, the kind introduction. And um, I guess good afternoon, good evening, uh, as the time is going on. Um, so uh, I just wanted, before I start, I just wanted to thank the panelists uh, and listening to your stories and what you do to support and help uh, businesses start up. It, it's uh, very encouraging to hear those words from each of you. So thank you so much. So as Ontario's Minister of Small Business, I'm very proud to stand here to celebrate entrepreneurs right across our province. And I'm here to also share how our government supports Ontario's vibrant small business ecosystem. I'd also like to thank, of course, Canada Startup Association for your work helping some of Ontario's best and brightest turn their dream of starting and growing a business into reality. Like the Canada Startup Association, our government understands the importance of helping and nurturing people who have the drive and determination to launch a business, and for good reason. Ontario has well over 400,000 small businesses. They form the backbone of our economy and employing well over 2.4 million people. Many thousands of those businesses are launched by people new to Canada who bring a strong entrepreneurial drive which significantly adds to what I like to call the Ontario spirit. And our government is working hard to further unleash Ontario's entrepreneurial spirit in communities right across our province. We've lowered taxes, reduced electricity costs, and cut red tape, which has enabled an estimated $8 billion in cost savings and support for Ontario's employers, with $3.6 billion of that impacting small businesses alone. And we're making it easier to access services, tools, resources, and programs to meet the diverse needs of entrepreneurs. And I know from personal experience that starting and running a business requires a great deal of time, sweat equity, and effort. In fact, it can sometimes be very overwhelming. To make starting a business easier, we launched Ontario.ca slash business, a one-stop shop for provincial services and supports to help business owners find what they need to grow here at home and in the global marketplace. And to support the next generation of bold business leaders, we committed $5 million to Futurepreneur Canada, where young entrepreneurs across the province can access mentorship programs and loan capital worth up to $20,000. We also created the Racialized and Indigenous Supports for Entrepreneurs Grant, often called RACE, a $20 million program that provides access to business development training, culturally responsive support services, and grant funding. And we also have an immigration stream under the Ontario Immigrant Nominee Program for foreign entrepreneurs interested in starting a new business or buying an existing business in Ontario. The entrepreneur stream is designed to attract foreign investment and talent and create jobs. We've created and have 17 regional innovation centers to help early stage or growing tech companies with the potential to expand and succeed on a global scale. And 47 small business enterprise centers across Ontario that provide on the ground support, funding and guidance to start and scale a business. We also created Intellectual Property Ontario a new agency that provides IP supports and services to help businesses and researchers commercialize their ideas and innovations. And in an increasingly online marketplace,
the Digitalization Competence Center was established as a virtual training and support center to increase digital literacy and help businesses adopt and implement new digital technologies and digitalize their operation. And with more and more people going online to purchase goods and services, businesses must be able to adapt to reach new customers within our borders and beyond. That's the foundation of the Digital Main Street program, which has helped more than 79,000 small businesses create and increase their digital presence and improve their productivity by offering grants, one-on-one -on -one support, and free training. So we look forward to continuing our work to help ensure that Ontario's businesses community can thrive in a challenging and evolving economic landscape on behalf of our government, I would like to thank our small businesses and entrepreneurs, so all of you, for reminding us that no matter who you are or where you come from, there's no better place in Ontario to start and scale up your business. Your work to support and elevate startups, amplify opportunities for their growth, and helping to build a robust entrepreneurial ecosystem businesses can take advantage of is very paramount. Our government is proud to support and partner with organizations like yours achieve success. Congratulations to all of the Canada Startup Association's success, and I thank you for helping build our economy and making Ontario the best place to live, work, invest, start a business, and raise a family. So thank you. to have like a question and answer session um, if any one of you have any questions for Minister Tangri uh, and with the panelists if, please let us know So just at the end of September, we closed uh, the last intake. So we're hoping uh, in the spring, actually that program has come to its uh, the end <laughs> of the, uh, so when I was previously small business red tape reduction minister, I added an additional $40 million uh, for the two years. So that two years is just coming up to its close. So I'm hoping to get some funding back into there so we can reopen it again. So uh, the, the, the digital Main Street program, I, throughout COVID was an absolute, um, saved many, many businesses to help them get an online presence, just have a website, a point of sale system, an app, uh, something, anything along those lines just to help those businesses. They were closed uh, for in-person um, retail or hospitality or whatever it may be. So it really was a, a great success and I'm hoping to continue with that success. So we're actually going to Treasury Board very soon <laughs> to hope that we can get some, some funding. So when it was initially brought out, it was only uh, a one time. You could only apply once. So then we did uh, increase it throughout COVID to allow people to have a second round of that grant. Um, so not sure how it's going to look right now, but we're hoping that we can continue that and hopefully in the spring uh, we'll be able to open it up again. Thank you. Any other questions? Go ahead. Uh, uh, I'd like to thank you for being here with us today. Uh, rather a little bit of a more tough question. Um, you know, being a program such as the Main Street, there are a lot of efforts uh, to support entrepreneurs and small businesses, but we've been seeing the trend where a lot of that taxpayer dollar gets funneled back to big companies like Shopify, Google, Facebook, and actually leaves very little room for competition amongst the Canadian companies. And it's been a question that I've been getting a lot because we're also designated entities. Um, just wondering how, how can the government prevent from that happening in the future so we can actually support the Canadian businesses that need that? Need that so Shopify uh, through Google was part of the digital Main Street, but it was the digital service squads that were actually the ones that were paid, and they were often university college students uh, that were helping build these apps. And so that money didn't go to Shopify, Google. It actually went to those digital service squad squads, helping those businesses have that online presence or increase their presence as it was. So that particular program uh, didn't really go to those. But for some of them, they, may, they were able to utilize some of those dollars for more increase in ad space. Um, but outside of that, the vast majority, over 79,000 businesses were able to take advantage of it. So, um, you know, a futurepreneur that I spoke about is, is a strictly for young entrepreneurs and often through um, the university and college system is where a lot of them, you know, are helped uh, to 
get their, um, their idea, as it may be, off the ground and some seed funding up to $20,000. So that was it's dedicated. It's through, uh, often through BDC. So that's how they get their funding. But this is um, understandable when we're talking about taxpayers' dollars, because that's what it is. Uh, we want to make sure it's helping all of our businesses, especially, absolutely, especially our small businesses. Um, but, you know, for me, it's how do we help businesses get that idea right off the ground. And I've been listening to some of the panelists on how they help with angel investments and other, other ways to try and support those small businesses and help them, you know, not just get off the ground, but scale up. And, you know, we're, we're not too bad in like our small business space, but it's getting those small businesses under 100 employees to build up and scale up into a medium-sized business. We don't have a lot of medium-sized, about 8,000 businesses in Ontario, so it's not a big number. And then we have, of course, a very large corporation. So how do we help those businesses grow? Well, how do we help them uh, stabilize? And, you know, with the CBA loans coming up uh, potentially early next year, how do we keep those businesses in business, right? So, um, you know, our government is looking at ways and uh, we're working with the federal government to try and support our small business collectively. Actually, my counterpart federally, um, she's also in the same writing as myself, so we actually collaborate a lot together. So trying to find ways how we can help keep um, our businesses going and thriving as well. Or there are more challenges for them? Yes. All small businesses are really challenged these days. Yeah. It's really it, tough. It, it I was never, just I was yeah. speaking more about just the, the percentage of uh, venture funding that goes to, to women-owned businesses. Yeah. So when we talk about racialized or immigrant women or new to Canada women and um, women who are ethnic women, um, all, all that group, and given the fact that women generally suffer compared to like male counterpart in, in businesses and getting credibility for funding, for example, navigating all the legal taxation issues and all that, like we heard all about incubation kind of services where they are kind of stuck. So given that we have issues generally on one hand and on the other hand, being a woman new to Canada, what are your observations, both of you being from kind of how do we uh, solve this issue? Or how do we support those women who are new, who are women, and you don't understand maths. <laughs> Did you want to continue? Uh, so, so I'll chime in, and uh, absolutely, we recognize that, and it, it's it's very challenging. Um, it's it's often harder for women to network. It's often harder for women to, you know, there's, there's a lot of parts in place. It's 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 daycare, it's um, filling out applications. Um, so Canada Startup Association is one of those resources that will help um, help you with that, but also we as a government, we have a Women's Entrepreneurship Economic Fund, something similar to that, which is strictly for women. And then the RAISE grant, which is for racialized and indigenous supports, uh, is a grant specifically for that, where a lot of women have been able to take advantage of. So we absolutely recognize that. Reach out to us, ontario.ca slash business has all of those on their website, but feel free to reach out to us in our ministry, you know, as a small business ministry, it's our job. Or your local MPP can guide you uh, to us and we can support you in that. That's what we're there for. And you know, more than anything, we want to help you know businesses get off the ground. And a lot of us, a lot of newcomers to Canada, are, have that entrepreneurial spirit. As we've heard today, it's a, they want to own their own business. They may not be able to do it as soon as they arrive, but uh, eventually they do want to open their own business. So we want to help and support that in any way that we can. So we're here, and uh, and uh, Canada Startup I know has been doing a phenomenal job and uh, working together with organizations like Canada Startup where we can really uh, support all of you in, in the larger ecosystem. Yeah, I think uh, we just see, like I have a group coming to my house tomorrow. Um, I do a lot of hosting stuff at my house and, and part of the stories are just really painful, right? A lot of people that are coming from other countries uh, may have accents, like literally simple things like this and they go to get, um, uh, so the, a woman who's coming tomorrow has uh, arrived from Africa, has like this amazing business, but she can't get anyone to rent her space. And it's been a complete nightmare in Ottawa for more than 12 months, trying to just get a space. 
she has a growing business, she's got a bank account, she can pay rent, and there's just bias in the system. And so, you know, we are literally triaging at an individual level, going with them to make sure that they're, and finding out who these landlords are that are stopping this kind of stuff, getting manufacturing facilities, looking for places, warehousing spaces. Uh, and so within our community, we do a lot of sharing of these stories and networking with each other to see who to avoid, who's actually got a door open where, where you can get that support. And again, it comes back to the earlier comment about being in community and collaborating together. Um, and so we're caring for each other and looking out for each other. And I think this is the number one thing is to try and get into a community that has folks that look like you, that have experiences like you, that can support you in this work. And so I'm really glad that you're starting this organization up. It's really, really, really important. And it's so much harder for newcomers that are coming. Um, there's just a lot of blocks and biases that we can't believe still exist in Canada. Like I was shocked by a whole bunch of these stories, but they just keep coming over and over of things that are happening in this day. So. Yeah, and sometimes they're asking for a minimum of one year's rent, I oh, think, yeah. yeah. If, I, if I could just make, uh, is my mic on? You yeah. can hear me all right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Uh, if I could just make one comment, I think uh, of the number of clients that we are currently working with, almost 40% would be women-led companies. And Tamina yes, would be very familiar with one in particular, but uh, we've got women from... Uh, the uh, the Caribbean. We've got women from uh, Vietnam. We've got women from Iran. So we have women from around the globe, and we welcome them. And they're really good entrepreneurs. Yes, Sorry. So a shameless plug for the Ontario Chamber Network. Uh, <laughs> glad to be in the house of uh, our colleagues from Toronto Board of Trade, the largest uh, chamber within the Ontario Chamber of Commerce Network. Uh, past president. Lifetime member, Brent from Board of Trade, a first generation immigrant from Pakistan. Um, perhaps we need to come up with some funding for new business women on startups to join local chambers <laughs> and network with the broader business ecosystem, mm -hmm. which will both validate the need their business is trying to fulfill, but at the same time will allow them to connect with the supply chain as well as the consumer base that the business needs to thrive. So, I hear all about camaraderie, and I'm quite frankly, that's what Chamber Network is all about. Yeah. I'm a product of uh, it, uh, and it's rather proud of it. Um, so just a suggestion, and that's it. Yeah, and, and we have the, the small business enterprise centers, and the, the Chamber Network and the municipalities tend to be behind that and do a lot of the work where they are. And, that's, and quite frankly, their job is to help you start a business and they're a resource and they're funded by government with your taxpayers dollars so uh, encouraging people to be part of their chamber network is, is massive and that networking within the chamber and I'll be quite frank when when I started my business I never even thought to join our Mississauga Board of Trade and I wasn't a member for many years and I kept thinking, well, I'm just a really small business, and I, you know, I'm in the service industry. I'm not really selling a product. I'm selling a service. And I, I felt that I might be intimidated because I was so small, and that, that what I thought was their scale. But when I joined, I realized that there were a lot of people just like me. And I think just get, overcoming that um, and just going there and joining and do your two-minute pitch uh, to everyone else that joins that breakfast session or whatever it may be, that networking session, you can really learn a lot from each other. And uh, telling your story, you can find, you might find that somebody might say, I want to invest in you. I really like what you're doing. It's a great idea. It's new. It's initiative. It's forward thinking. It's great for our economy. It's great for our climate. So, you know, there's, uh, don't, be, don't be shy to join the chamber networks or the boards of trade.
And that, that's what we're building, and that's what we need to hear. Where are the challenges? Where are the roadblocks? Where are the, the, the areas where you're, you're, they're stopping you at the door? I mean, legislation that was just um, introduced yesterday, I think it was, um, in the Ministry of Labor, Training, Immigration, Skills Development, um, was now when someone puts an ad up for a specific job, they have to put a range in there now that is going to be between, I don't know, 50,000 and 60,000 based on your experience, whatever it may be. It used to be people would not put that on and then they would see an immigrant and feel that they could pay them significantly less or a woman and feel that they could pay them significantly less. And I've seen this firsthand. This is not something that we're just making up. I've actually been through this myself um, where I was undervalued. And I think, and it was extremely unfair. And we heard this time and time again, especially in the gig economy, economy um, where women or new immigrants were paid significantly less for the same work. So, you know, that we're overcoming that. There's a range. I understand if someone's new to that industry or lesser qualified than somebody else, that maybe there's a difference in pay, but that range now has to be put on there. But this has just been introduced. It's not passed yet. So if it does, if it is passed, that will become law. Now. Hello. Yeah. Uh, the question is on the AI. So we have seen more and more uh, applications are being built. So is the uh, government working on some AI regulations or are you worried about that uh, more? Uh, so like multiple countries like EU is working on EU, uh, AI regulation. Does the government of Ontario is working on such similar kinds of uh, bills like that? AI, you to artificial intelligence? Yes. Yeah, so, this, the, so artificial intelligence, uh, and, and I'll go back to my previous role in red tape reduction on how we want to move forward with artificial intelligence, but we have to do it responsibly, right? There's a, there's a massive privacy issue there, and, you know, artificial intelligence can help us get to, you know, numerous steps and, and technology and, you know, the machine learning is so fast. Um, it's almost thinking for us, right? And you, you can't take that human out of it. But at the same time, we understand this is the way we are moving forward. But like I said, there are so many checks and balances that must be put in there to make sure that one, our privacy, our privacy. I mean, every day we're hearing about uh, hacks into systems that are taking our data. And uh, I, I'm getting notifications from numerous sources every day where they're saying, well, they've hacked into the Home Depot credit card or this credit card and that one, and they've got our data now. And people are worried that their banking information is being leaked out. So artificial intelligence may solve that problem, it, or it may add to it. I, I mean, I'm no specialist in that field, but we're very, very concerned that it has to be done responsibly. Check. Yeah, and I know many of our universities and colleges are working on programs with private sector and with government um, on where they're building these technologies. I know Mars Discovery District just around the corner are doing a lot of work, but it's in a lot of different areas, right? So some of it's with, you know, bioscience, biotech, which is, you know, very sensitive. Um, so it has, like I said, it has to be done when we're talking about genetic sequences and DNA samples and things like that. We want to make sure that that data is protected. Um, but AI can play a big role in us helping, uh, helping us learn how to solve, um, you know, potentially cure many, many diseases or at least enhance our lives, right? So that's in the life science industry, but there's so many areas where artificial intelligence can really help us support. Are we behind many other jurisdictions? I think we are. Um, have we been moving fast enough? A lot of it's federal 
fortunately or unfortunately, I should say, we're provincial, so we don't have control over a lot of it. But um, <clears throat> I'd like us to see, to see us go a little bit faster. But like I said, each step of the way, we want to put those checks and balances in place so that it is done responsibly. But if you have a technology that uh, you feel you've already done that, you've, you've put in those um, the, um, those uh, check balance checks and balances, then we want to see it. We want to know what it's about and, and how you're utilizing it and where it can be used in the greater, in on the province of Ontario and throughout Canada. Oh, globally. We want to help you go global. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. One last. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to respond. Uh, people can hear me. I don't need the mic. Uh, so uh, about the uh, credit card issue. After 26 years of coin banking career and transitioning to startup No, no, that's correct. So they, they are not, uh, they, they, look, they want you not just as a new, they want you over your whole entire lifetime in Canada. So they know that targeting newcomers to take their first credit card uh, and build that, uh, that credit with them, they know over the long term they're going to keep you for, for a lifetime as a customer and uh, eventually you'll be having mortgages from there and putting your savings in there. So that's their, you know, so they, they really do want your business. But that, I think that gentleman did have a question. Yeah, I just want to add a comment here. So what she was telling uh, about the credit card thing is actually for the startup visa entrepreneurs who are coming here. So they will not be able to get any credit card, anything. And even if, you know, they are establishing business here, but to just open a bank account, it will take, you know, it would take around three months because they are, not here on a startup visa when you are coming here, so you are on a work permit, close work permit on your own business. So until you get the PR, you are not considered a Canadian. Yes. So yes. that you, you know, welcome to Canada program is for the immigrants who are coming here on PR, not for the startup entrepreneur. So there is a big difference. And that's why we are here advocating for that. Okay, so that's the conversation that I will have with the, my federal counterpart to make sure that the uh, the banks, because if banks are federally uh, <laughs> are run, but um, but I will um, definitely put that in there. And just but just the other side of that also, just remember when you're coming as an entrepreneur, you're coming with money that you're expected to be able to like control, you, uh, help uh, do that yourself. You're supposed to have enough funds. Um, but still, you still need to build credit uh, over the long term. And I, th I don't think we're talking about, you know, wanting to borrow hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. I think it's more just to have a, a credit card and a, a, to be able to buy those purchases for your immediate needs, right? So, so go ahead. So I'm in supply chain. I've spent 18 years in supply chain. I deal with talents and technology. So I know now it's illegal to ask new immigrant about Canadian experience, right? Almost, we are almost there. Like we are almost the last one mile left. Uh, can we should do something like for entrepreneurs, Canadian experience not required for banks. Uh, that will make life easy, uh, really, really life easy. I've seen this for 18 years now. So uh, on the AI side, as I said, I develop. Uh, I'm into breach business. I've, I'm struggling for two years. Uh, one of the most problems selling my product, I can identify the bridges, but when I call the, uh, the companies who are involved in the bridges and uh, the credentials, the privacy is at risk for so many people, uh, their only answer is, even with Petro-Canada, I'll, I'll name it them, uh, breach happened a few months back. Mm -hmm. And the number one problem is there is no federal law. You cannot like do whatever you want to do. That's what they reply back. We don't have GDPR or for provincial level CCPA kind of a, uh, legislations which says privacy is the most important part of your freedom. Uh, Ontario really needs to do something. I think B, uh, Bill C-27 is going to address that little bit part and the federal uh, C-11 is coming up too. But I think we need to, to do 
really better on talent and technology part to have that competitive uh, environment built up in Ontario. Yeah. And that's my, my two cents. No, and I completely agree. And, and like I said, we work very closely with our federal uh, counterparts to try and, you know, we want the ease of doing business <laughs> on the one hand, but we want to make sure that things are protected. So, I mean, in my, my previous role as red tape reduction, I mean, I, it just my one year there was $700 million. Uh, $400 million was my target. I hit $465 million in savings for individuals and businesses. So the license plate sticker money that you don't have to pay anymore, even on your commercial vehicles, that was my bill. And I said, it's a little bit of money in everybody's pocket, but it makes a difference, right? And, and you know, it was all about, um, you still have to renew. Please make sure you renew your license plates. <laughs> we need to know you own that vehicle. We need to know that you have insurance and the odometer reading. But it's that it, it, with the cost of doing the program versus the cost savings to you, I mean, it was almost balancing itself out. So why not help? you as opposed to that money going to the government and then paying for a program that was very expensive. So we need more ideas like that. So if you have anything that you want to share with us, if there's red tape that you're facing, like, like you're telling me today, um, we want to find ways to help that, remove those, you know, those barriers that you have to help you either start a business or to grow your business or to employ people or to bring people from overseas on Ontario Immigrant Nominee Program. You know, it could be a massive success, but we still have to work with the federal government to get some of those approvals. So we're working with them where we were only, we only had, I think, 6,000, we're up to 9,000. It's going to be 18,000 people that we are going to be able to bring in that we need in our economy immediately. But the entrepreneurship program is so underutilized. We do not get enough people applying for that program. I can tell you, we want more people coming here, bringing that money, opening a business, or there's a lot of succession planning that we have a big issue with right now. There's a lot of great companies here that are profitable, but their children are not interested in that business or they're doing their own thing, or um, there's no key person that wants to buy out that business. So they want to retire, or maybe they've even passed on. So those businesses just end up closing, but they're great businesses, they're thriving. So there's another opportunity for many people to come here. And it's something that I'm working on right now to help go and bring some more entrepreneurs in. But we'd like to hear from you, so please, please reach out. Thank you, Priti. Thank you. <laughs> we have a question. She came from you know, all the way from Pakistan to dance. Oh, yeah. oh sure. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So I am one of those um, startups who's planning to come here and start a business. So I was, I was just having a, uh, it's, it's just, uh, I wanted to know whether Canada has some sort of a, uh, you know, a policy where if we are a startup and obviously we need to see traction in the first year, is there some sort of an academia linkage to us where we can actually hire internees in the first year where the government pays for them? So this is sort of like a program that was in Portugal when we were in Lisbon. Uh, there was something like that where we could hire internees or university graduates or, or people graduating out. And for the first eight months, I think, yeah, the government used to pay for them. Is there something like that here as well? So there are numerous programs, uh, co-ops, internships, apprenticeships, um, and you must pay them. <laughs> they, they must be paid. Um, however, there are programs and there's funding available within the province and the federal government. But I don't know if some of our panelists may actually um, know it more than I do. I don't know if you wanted to tap in to some of that, but there are definitely programs there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So there are programs and there are few startup entrepreneurs also who are bringing that program. So you will not be get 100% paid, but there are certain percentage that government, you know, provincial and federal government is supporting. Wonderful. Thank you. You are the one who's going to have to connect me with them. Thank Love you. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Minister. Thank you.
you, Minister Tangri. You shared great insight. There are so many resources available and initiatives that she has taken, her office has taken, including uh, being part of the Small Business Enterprise Center. Like, uh, you know, she's done great work, and we want to support you, especially in the entrepreneurship program. Uh, great panelists. Uh, Robert, being in, uh, in the designated incubation center, you're actually creating a solid foundation for the international entrepreneurs, whether they are from India, Pakistan, Iran. So thank you so much for, you know, your programs. I, I, I being from the startup, ecosystem. I, I, I really appreciate the program offerings that you have at Roseview. Uh, Kate wanted to say, like, I love what you shared about, you know, own your mistakes. I did the same thing when I was new in Canada. And uh, yeah, it, it really helps you to evolve as a better person. And you show that sincerity. Um, Kanwal, I loved your story about the immigrant, uh, you know, as an immigrant and carving a niche here in the entrepreneurial ecosystem, would love to connect with you and how we can help you. Um, uh, Vicky, uh, I, I appreciate how you host women entrepreneurs and how you're supporting them and being a bridge builder. Um, you mentioned about um, uh, one of uh, the women entrepreneur facing issues in finding a space. Um, maybe in uh, Ottawa Economic Development, maybe they can help in finding the right space for your client. I'm sure that's one of the avenue that you can explore for your client. Um, so now without much further, the, the question answer session went for a very long time, which was very interesting. Uh, we have a very interesting segment coming up, but um, I, would, uh, I would ask my uh, fellow um, uh, director of uh, partnerships at, at CSA, Carlos, to uh, introduce you with the next segment. It's the breakout session. So over to you, Carlos. Hi, everyone. How's it going? Uh, my name is Carlos, and I'm really excited to be here today. I actually flew in from Vancouver. I'm based out of there uh, to be here with all of you. It's really inspiring to be in a, in a room full of many people and players from the ecosystem. Um, I'm, as as Preeti said, I'm supporting the CSA team with the partnership development. My professional experience has pretty much been at the intersection of impact and supporting entrepreneurs in both for-profit and non-profit and for non-profit organizations. Uh, this year, in particular, I've had the privilege of meeting incredible startup champions like Tamina and many innovative businesses, most, most of which are co-founded by uh, immigrant entrepreneurs through the Startup Visa program. The next part of our event, and unfortunately the last one for today, are our roundtable discussions. Uh, this is gonna be a great opportunity for your network and to also dive into specific topics that we got prepared uh, and that will be facilitated by four of our, of our guests today. Um, when I mention your name, maybe you can raise your hand so that people know who the facilitator is. Uh, first one I've got here is Mohsin Mukhtar, who is over there. So he is in a startup advisor and mentor with rich expertise in commercial operations, finance and process improvement, who will be facilitating a session on finance and funding. We also have John McGraw, International trade professional that supports newcomers, expats, and businesses connect across cultures. He'll be facilitating a discussion on cultural transformation. We have Rambavu Basupili, a career coach guiding job seekers in Canada, India, and the USA, who will be leading the discussion around digital transformation. And then we got Dinesh Sharma, author, speaker, and HR leader with 25 years of global experience in North American India, who will lead our hiring and talent management discussion. Our facilitators, as you might have noticed, are strategically located across the room. Each one of them will be guiding a discussion around a particular topic, finance and funding, cultural transformation, digital transformation, and hiring and talent management. Uh, you will all have a some time for introductions. I believe uh, we're gonna have a discussion for about 20 to 25 minutes. I recognize that the room is quite packed, so if you prefer, Sue, so you could decide to go outside and have the discussion with your facilitator there, or you can stay in the room and just be in the, in, in the round table uh, with the discussion. Uh, and with that, I'm gonna hand it over to each of the facilitators uh, that are in your tables, and if you don't have one facilitator near you, make sure that you connect to one of them. Uh, and I really hope this is an insightful uh, session for 